Let me and know when live. she's ready. Oh, Thank we're you. live. So I call this hearing of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board to order. Please be advised that this hearing is being live streamed and recorded. Oh, hold on. Sorry, Keith. Give me one second. I don't know how to get the audio. Mm -hmm. Are you plugged in? Are you just plugged in? Yeah. Um. Can I get a, a bit of a sound check? And okay. So this is a sound check. We're getting some feedback on there, Denise. This yeah, is we got sound. We were good. That's good now. So this is a bit of a sound check for our live stream. So thank you once again, sorry for the delay. Go ahead, Keith. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. I call this hearing of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board to order. Please be advised that this hearing is being live streamed and recorded. My name is Keith Hodson and I will be acting as the chair today Please direct all questions and comments through me. There are three other board members with, me, with us today who I will now ask to introduce themselves. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Clark. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Eileen Lefley. And Christine. And I'm Christine <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, will the clerk now introduce herself and identify this appeal? Uh, my name is Denise Lines. The board will be hearing an appeal affecting the property legally described as Plan 2089BN, Block 15, Lot 1, Civic Address 315, 3rd Avenue East. The development application is T00083-21D. The appeal was submitted by Albert Flutman of Localis Planning and Local Government Services on behalf of the property owner, Darwin Durney. The notice of the appeal is as follows. The grounds for the appeal submitted without prejudice and subject to amendment or addition at the hearing are as follows. The land use bylaw has been misinterpreted and conditions two, three, 10, 11, 12, and 13 are not authorized by section 5.14 of land use bylaw 1620. Condition E, invalidating the permit should not appeal, sh should an appeal be made against the decision is not authorized by the Municipal Government Act and is contrary to the principles of due process, especially as this permit is not, is for a permitted use. Notices were posted within the newspaper as well as on our website. Thank you, Denise. Uh, can, now, can we now have the parties present themselves starting with Daryl? Uh, good afternoon, uh, SGAB. I am the uh, development officer. I'm Daryl Drohomersky. I'm also the chief administrative officer for the town of Drumheller, and I will be speaking on behalf of the development authority. And Mr. Flutman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Ms. Lines has already said, I'm Albert Flutman. I'm the principal of Localis. Um, I am appearing here today on behalf of the property owner, Darwin K. Durney. <clears throat> Um, just by way of a quick introduction, I am a registered professional planner in the, in the province of Alberta. Uh, I've got about 30 years worth of experience in planning and, and uh, local government, and uh, those are in essence my credentials as I present here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have introduced ourselves. Does anyone here object to any of the members on the panel for this appeal? Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Um, as I think everyone's aware, my client has a, a longstanding relationship with the, with the town of Drumheller, and uh, he wants to ensure that his concerns about potential conflict of interest are uh, a, at least a, a matter of the record. I, I, I realize that uh, declarations of uh, conflict of interest or pecuniary interest uh, have to come from the, the individuals themselves, and they need to... Uh, uh, make that their, their own decision in that regard. Um, however, um, 
there, the, the relationship between my client and, and the town of Drumheller, uh, let's, let's say, broke down uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, and and there, and he was uh, terminated from his role as as, as a consultant and as uh, uh, as um, the chief flood chief resiliency and flood mitigation officer. Uh, so he wants to ensure that the this panel is is understanding and appreciative of that potential conflict. Uh, Councillor DeMott, of course, is a member of town council and, and was involved in, in those conversations. Um, he wants to ensure that uh, Ms. Clark is no longer affiliated with the town solicitor. Um, and the, the last item, while I'm very appreciative of Ms. Lyons' professionalism and, and the way that she's coordinated uh, the hearing, uh, it's been excellent. She is the executive assistant to the CAO, who in this case is also the development officer, as he's just introduced himself. And, and the relationship between CAO and the EA is a, is a very close working relationship. So, um, and of course, the clerk is, is present during your deliberations to support the to support the board, um, quite necessarily. But there, we're concerned about a potential conflict of interest in in that regard. Um, Again, I, I don't think there's anything I can demand in this regard, but I would respectfully ask the board to keep this in mind as it deliberates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plutman. Right. Are there any comments from Mr. members Chair? of the SDAB? Go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Sharon Clark, uh, an issue or potential issue is raised with respect to my relationship, if any, with town solicitors. I would like to place clearly on the record that I retired as a practicing lawyer over two years ago. And uh, I have, other than I suppose, you know, social relationships, but I have absolutely no relationship with the town solicitors. Thank you. Uh, Christine, would you like to make any comments? Yeah, um, I suppose that there is a perceived conflict, I suppose, because, of course, my position on council. However, I am willing to go forward with being a part of this board for this hearing. And I will follow strictly to the information that we have in front of us to help come to a decision, if that's permitted. Thank you. Uh, Denise, would you like to speak? Uh, I can appreciate the concern. Um, my role as clerk is simply a sub administrative support um, and I fully understand the division between my job as the administrative assistant um, for the CIO's office and the mayor's office uh, and my role as the clerk and the fact that they are not they are, they are not synonymous. They are, um, as with the SDAB training, as, as well as the assessment review board training, you take off one hat to perform this role as the clerk. Um, and so as long as everyone is uh, confident that with my ability to do that, then I would like to continue on in this role. Thank you, Denise. Now that we've heard from uh, Sharon, Denise and Christine, are, does anyone else wish to comment on the uh, appropriateness of them continuing with the hearing? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Flutman, are you okay if we proceed given the information you've received? With all respect to your role, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's it, it's between you and, and the panel to make that determination. Uh, however, and, and uh, uh, however, I will note that uh, the members have stated their, their, their position, I think, quite clearly, and that's a matter of record, and uh, um, I think we can, we can proceed on that basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other preliminary issues that parties wish to raise at this point? Hearing none, I'm just going to provide some explanatory comments. The purpose of this hearing is for the applicant, for the appellant, the development authority, and others affected by the matter under appeal to give the board their perspective and to provide evidence to support their submissions. The board must base its 
decision on the planning merits of the application, the evidence presented, and the legislated land planning documents. Our usual practice is to begin with submission from the two main parties, that is the development authority and the appellant. After that, we hear from affected landowners and members of the public. After each party has presented its evidence, the other parties have an opportunity to ask questions. Lastly, the board may have questions of its own. If anything new arises, each party has an opportunity to respond. We then conclude the hearing by giving the two main parties and any other party who has made substantial submissions an opportunity to summarize their evidence and explain why they think it supports the decision they want, with the applicant having the last word. Does anyone have any questions about this procedure or how it will apply today? No. Hearing none, when making your presentations, please ensure all comments are directed through the chair, that is through myself. Also, please try to keep your comments succinct and respectful. If another person has already made a point you agree with and you have nothing substantial to add, please simply state that you agree with it. If you are reading from a written statement or making a presentation, please leave a copy with the board as this will assist the clerk in preparing the minutes and the board in making its decision. Also, if you want to refer to a document you have brought along with you like a map, photograph or report, please leave a copy with the board. And as this is a virtual hearing, please leave your camera on during the hearing. Mr. Flutman, when you're making the presentation, we understand that your camera can't be on at the same time, but uh, during discussions, we would appreciate you turning it back on. Thank you. If there's nothing else, then uh, we'll move on with the Development Authority presentation. Mr. Jerome Mersky, please. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Uh, hearing process um, uh, requires that, of course, that the Subdivision Development Authority, or, or sorry, the Subdivision Development Appeal Board base their deliberations and decision on evidence presented at the hearing today. Um, I, I would like, I would respectfully ask that you confirm that uh, members of the board have not visited the site or discussed this appeal with, with anyone since the, the appeal was registered. Uh, we can... I certainly, have, Mr. Chair, uh, Sharon, I have certainly not visited the site, nor have I discussed this appeal with, with anybody. Christine? I have drove by, but not visited the site or know really much about what's going on until what we hear today. Eileen? No, I have not visited the site or discussed it with anyone. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I did have one person ask me about it. I referred them to the town website uh, for the documentation. Okay. Please proceed, Daryl. Thank you. Can you all see a uh, report from SDAB uh, on your screens? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, my uh, presentation before you today, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, SDAB <clears throat> is, um, I think um, Denise has talked a little bit about the, the beginning part of uh, uh, the application. So not the, uh, the appellant submitted an application for occupancy of a tourist dwelling on June 11th, 2021. The uh, tourist dwelling is located in a neighborhood uh, district uh, area of downtown. The application was approved on June 22nd as a permitted use for this district with the conditions listed on a notice of decision. Excuse me, the appellant appealed the decision on July 13th, indicating they believe several conditions are not applicable as they are not defined in the current land use bylaw. And I've created a table below to address each of those conditions. So. Uh, specifically, the appellant has talked about 5.14 of the land use bylaw. Uh, I believe I see that I've actually made a mistake, and it, uh, it says there's been misinterpreted conditions two, three, it should be 10, 11, 12, and 13, not 20, uh, are not authorized under 514. So 
514 says that the development authority may impose such conditions on the approval of the application as, in their opinion, are necessary to uphold the intent and objectives of the municipal development plan, uphold the intents and, and objectives of any other statutory or non-statutory plan under preparation or as adopted that, that is applicable to this site, meet the applicable requirements of this bylaw and ensure orderly and economic development of land in this town. And while not specifically in, indicated on the appeal, uh, 5.14.2 of this uh, appeal deals specifically with off-site levy. So I'm, I, I have made the presumption that the appellant did not have any concerns about that area of this because it was not applicable to the site. Although it was not specifically addressed in the letter of 5.1.514.1. So, uh, so under <clears throat> Condition number two, so the condition appealed uh, was must conform to the Town and Drum Heather Community Standards Bylaw 0619. The reason it's been included is Clause 9.5J in the Municipal Development Plan states the municipality shall prioritize uh, the enforcement, or sorry, prioritize enforcement of community standards bylaw in the downtown. So if we go back up to the top about uh, point number one is uphold the intents and objectives objectives of the municipal development plan. So we believe that that's a clause that uh, should uh, fits perfectly for that. And then in the land use bylaw, section 1.3.5 states that when in conflict, this bylaw shall take precedence over those of other municipal bylaws. So again, we felt that um, this is a, a reasonable inclusion. So we believe that this belongs, our recommendation is that we believe this belongs in the condition sections of the notice of decision. However, if the board requires the section in the notice of decision titled requirements may be added with this clause being moved to the section. So we would have one would be a condition of the development and then other would be general requirements. Number, oh, sorry, uh, there was more stuff here. Yes, so <clears throat> 1.3.5 states that when a conflict is bylaw takes precedence over those of other municipal bylaws. The community standards bylaw deals with unsightly premises abatement of noise, control of weeds, and public disturbances. The inclusion of the clause in those conditions have been standard to date, and in, in this case particular, uh, or in this particular case is applicable to the requested use of a tourist dwelling, which may have a higher degree of noise and public disturbances relative to owner-occupied or compared to owner-occupied properties. So again, we, we believe it should stay in here. Uh, however, we we would be willing to move it to a, a new section in the notices of decision called requirements. Point three, an annual business license is required. So under 5.14.1 clause four, or sub clause four, ensure the orderly and economic development of land in a town. So we interpret this clause to indicate that as a business operating in a town, it is required to operate as a licensed business. Uh, so same as above, if we if uh, SDAB makes the decision, we could move this from uh, the condition section to a requirement section. However, we believe that this is uh, also good information to have for the for all applicants, as some people do not understand that they do need a business license uh, when having something like a um, a bed and breakfast or a tourist dwelling. So, point ten. The site and building structures and improvements shall be maintained in a clean, neat, tidy, and attractive condition and free from all rubbish and debris. So again, clause 9.5 uh, sub point J in the municipal development plan states that the municipality shall prioritize the enforcement of the community standards bylaw in the downtown. Clause 511.2 sub clause five, uh, this clause was present in section 47DI of the previous land use bylaw 10.08, and this was included erroneously as a condition of the, in this notice of decision. So what we're saying in here is that this, this condition in here has been in the previous land use bylaws, and uh, it was included in here erroneously. However, we do feel that it does belong in here, um, as, as we have said in the municipal development plan, that it does uh, say that we should be uh, prioritizing the enforcement of the community standards bylaw in the downtown. And as noted above, this is uh, in the downtown area, this uh, dwelling. At point 11, the development shall conform to any and all federal, provincial and or municipal regulations and or guidelines that may apply. 
Section 1.3.4 of the Land Use Bylaw states that in addition to the requirements of this bylaw, a person is required to comply with all federal, provincial, and other municipal legislation. So we believe the wording is nearly identical, however, and has the same meaning, therefore no change is required. Point number 12, prior to the commencement and occupancy of business activities, confirmation must be provided to the development officer from the local fire authority and health authority that the building is occupiable for such purposes. So our response is though appropriate to include as a reminder, it is noted that this specific wording is not included in the current version of the land use bylaw. So if required, a section of the notice of decision titled requirements may be added with this clause being moved to this section. And lastly, point 13 that was being appealed, the development shall be revocable at any time if the use has become detrimental to the amenities of the neighborhood. So this was the inclusion from the conditions of the previous land use bylaw. And we believe it was an accidental exclusion from the current land use bylaw. So we are in the process of updating the land use bylaw and this clause will be included as the tourist dwelling, part of the tourist dwelling section in the upcoming changes to the land use bylaw, which is scheduled for next month. So in summary of item one of the appeal, we believe that all conditions except for 12 are valid and are applicable to this notice of decision as they are listed in the land use bylaw 16.20 or also in the municipal development plan. If required, a separate section on the notice of decision document may be added called requirements that are considered general rules to be followed for all developments. Item two of the appeal states that condition E, which, which indicates that the development permit is invalid should an appeal be made against this decision and reinstated if approved by the SDAB. The grounds of this validity are, specific, are specifically because it is considered a permitted use and is therefore allowed. Clause 5.15.5.5 of the land use bylaw states that pursuant to 5.17 of this bylaw, the development permit which has been granted shall not come into effect until the appeal has been determined and the development permit may be modified or nullified based on the results of the appeal. Further, 5.17.1 subclause 3 states that the applicant may appeal the development permit to the SDAB if the development authority issues a development permit subject to conditions, which has been done. So it seems that the wording of the invalid in condition E should be changed to the wording described in 5.15.5 above, that the permit shall not come into effect. Even though the use of the tourist dwelling is permitted in this district, if the applicant is appealing conditions set out in the development permit, common sense should dictate that the development may not continue until the appeal has been heard and decided upon by SDAB. And that's it uh, for my report, uh, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions? Chair? I think you were muted there, Keith. I'm sorry I was. Um, are there any questions on the presentation, Mr. Flutman? Yes, I have uh, one question uh, for, for the development officer. Uh, could he clarify where he sees that the, this property is located within the downtown? because uh, my copy of the land use bylaw shows that it's in the neighborhood district, not in the downtown district. Uh, it is described, it is in um, a map for the downtown area revitalization plan, uh, which is one of the um, subservient documents that was, um, that flows underneath this and it, and the downtown area. So not downtown district, but downtown area uh, encompasses all everything from Fifth Street East to almost McConkey Park on the west. You have anything further to ask on that, Mr. Putman? Uh, no, I'll, I'll speak to you a bit later. Okay, thank you. Any questions from board members at this point? Christine? 
Yeah, sorry, Daryl. Could you just um, run by those ones that you were you said you were considering putting in a requirements category? Sorry, I wasn't able to see or sorry. get them there. Okay, I'll start at the top with them. So, so we're looking at uh, point number two. Um, so we believe that uh, point number two should stay in as a condition uh, because it does state under the municipal development plan that. It does specifically say community standards bylaw. Uh, again, if there's a recommendation uh, to change it, we would add a section called requirements, which would be general. And this would be general to all development permits, not or notices of decision, not just something for a tourist dwelling. Uh, and we would be, uh, uh, we could move it to something like that. So basically the requirements would be things that you need to do as a it's almost like a good neighbor guide, uh, if I was to describe it as such, that regardless if you're doing a tourist dwelling or a, a single family dwelling or a commercial establishment, you would have the same requirements that need to be followed. So, so that would be number two. Uh, number three, an annual business license. And um, number 10, again, which does, it's, a, it's one of the, uh, fall or parts of uh, the community standards bylaw. But again, so that ties back into the um, um, recommendation section or, or a requirement section under a recommendation. And um, number 12, which does not, is, is not in there right now. Um, however, um, we think that that would be something again, I, I think again, from a a comfort level specifically for tourist dwellings or bed and breakfasts or something that, that houses people, we would think that we would want to have the comfort of knowing that they've been inspected by fire and health to ensure that they are safe for the public to stay in. Uh, so we would put that as a requirement and uh, if we felt that it was uh, needed to change. Excellent, thank you, ones. Daryl. Can you lower your hand, please, Christine? Sharon, I noticed that you aren't muted. Did you have questions? No. Can you mute the, your microphone, please? Are there any other questions for Mr. Drohomirsky at this point? Seeing none. Oh, uh, Christine we'll has a question, up. sorry. Keith. Go ahead. Sorry, just a quick one for confirmation. I do see on here, this was, it's it's tourist dwelling, not bed and breakfast, correct? That is correct, yes. Perfect, thank you. And, and there is a difference between yes, the Yes, there is, yeah, yeah, I just want to for, for, but thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Uh, so I'm just going to, we're just going to label this report SDAB 2021-07.13 number one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Flutman, are you prepared to uh, carry on with your presentation at this point? Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Please do so. Thank you. So can you see the, the PowerPoint? Excellent. I'm not going to start the slideshow because it might do something different on me again. So I think it's quite clear the way it is. <laughs> Thank you. So as, as you're already aware, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for, for hearing this, this appeal today. I, I do appreciate this opportunity. Um, the subject property, as you've already heard, is located at 315 3 Avenue East at the intersection of 3 Street near downtown Drumheller. Uh, it's a substantial white stucco two-story heritage home built back in the 1920s. It's often described as McVeigh Manor. And uh, the, the photo on your screen is a photo of the front of the house uh, on 3 Avenue. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty substantial heritage home, two stories, uh, three bedrooms upstairs. It's a center hall plan house. It's, a, it's really quite a nice property. Uh, the second photo shows um, a portion of the backyard with a concrete patio and, and, a, and a rear porch. 
Um, so you, as you can see, it's a, it's, it's, it's a well-maintained uh, valued heritage home. Uh, I just want to give you some more context. This is the second home for the owner. It's not consistently occupied. Therefore, the owner and his spouse, uh, Michelle Tetreau, have chosen to market it as a tourist dwelling to make it available as a short-term rental for visitors to Drumheller. So with three spacious bedrooms upstairs, two bathrooms, and an expansive main floor, including formal living and dining rooms, it's an attractive option for larger families with children. The property has been advertised with Airbnb. So the intent of a tourist dwelling uh, is to make available on a short-term rental basis, private homes to visitors to a, to a community. So it's not a, a bed and breakfast, of course, a bed and breakfast is where individual rooms are rented out. A tourist dwelling is where the, the entire home is rented out on a short-term basis of less than 28 days at a time. If it was a, if it was rented for more than 28 days at a time, that be just, that's just an ordinary rental property. Um, these are often desired by couples or families traveling together who appreciate the amenities of a quiet residential setting along with space to relax and cooking facilities that make it convenient for them to prepare their own food. Um, at this point, I'd like to note that Airbnb has, uh, uh, has been contacted. We've discussed this appeal with them. They don't represent um, member, uh, members of Airbnb with, with individual matters. They, they do engage with municipalities though at a policy level. Uh, they've drafted, but as far as I know, not yet sent a letter to the mayor. I'm, I'm going to summarize the comments in this draft letter and I can uh, provide a copy of, of the draft for the record as well. In fact, at this point, I, I will say that I will, later I'll forward to Ms. Lyons this presentation, my speaking notes and, and a copy of this letter. So you will have it for, for your records and, and to assist in, in preparing the, uh, the written decision. Um, Airbnb, as you probably know, provides an online reservation platform for the owners of private dwellings to share them uh, with others as short-term rentals. These rentals range from a bedroom to a suite to a carriage house to, to an entire home. Uh, we're allowed even Airstream travel trailers are rented out. Uh, in many cases, people who stay in Airbnbs are looking for a unique guest experience, not simply an economical place to stay. Uh, you don't stay at McVeigh Manor because it's cheap. You stay there because it's a beautiful home and you, you can have your family with you. Um, Airbnb encourages municipalities to employ a common sense approach that makes it easy for owners to comply with municipal bylaws. They've actually worked extensively with Calgary and Edmonton and, and those cities are examples of this. They've, they've both decided not to require development permits for tourist dwellings, but rather business licenses only. The business licensing process in Calgary is graduated as well. Fire inspections are only required if more than four bedrooms are available for rent. The benefit to this is that owners are more likely to follow the bylaw requirements and comply. So it's, it's a, the point is to make, make the process straightforward for, for homeowners. Um, now Airbnb recognizes that there've been problems when entire, where entire homes have been rented as a location for a party and damages and, and disturbances uh, result. They've taken steps to flag high risk rentals and they routinely decline these kinds of reservations. And I think it's an age-based system where if the primary renter's under 25, they will, they will uh, heavily screen it if, if someone wants to rent a, an entire home. And they also provide through their website access to a neighborhood support team to deal with concerns about parties or excessive noise. So they recognize the issue, they've taken steps to address it. Um, I would imagine it, it has been a problem in major cities in the past. Uh, hopefully it's, it's not the case anymore. I don't, I think though in the, in the mid, vast majority of, of cases, it's, it's, uh, it's never an issue. Of course, in the case at hand, we've got a valued, well-maintained property and the intent is to rent to family groups looking for spacious accommodation for a visit to Drumheller. Um, the property is located in the neighborhood district according to land use bylaw 16.20. It is surrounded by residential uses, mostly single detached homes of varying size, as might be expected in a mature neighborhood. The tourist dwelling is a permitted use in the neighborhood district. It's not discretionary, it's permitted. The bylaw defines tourist dwelling as a single dwelling unit occupied by a single party of guests for a period of 28 days or less and contains sleeping and sanitary facilities and may include cooking and eating facilities. And of course, if it's rented for more than 28 days at a time, it's a normal residential rental. So the, the point here is that it's, it's uh, renting a, a private dwelling. 
on, on a short-term basis. I think that's, that's the essence of this. It's not a hotel or an inn. Um, and to be clear, the development permit is needed not because new development is, is occurring, but because of a very slight change of use from a private dwelling to a private dwelling that is rented out part of the time on a nightly basis. No alterations to the property are needed to accommodate this change of use. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the legislative background and, and uh, I, I hope this isn't too pedantic. Uh, it may be things that you already know from your training and, 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 and your experience, but I'm, I'm going to go through it anyway because I want to es uh, establish the context and, and the basis for this appeal. Uh, part seven, sorry, part 17 of the Municipal Government Act deals with planning and development. This part enables municipal planning, uh, regulates and provides for the approval of subdivision of land, provides authority for the regulation of land use through land use bylaws, and deals with other matters related to land. The authority of the municipal councils over these matters is articulated in sections 615 to 708 of the Act. Uh, Division 2, Section uh, 623, requires a council to, by bylaw, designate, it, designate a development authority to exercise development powers and perform duties on behalf of the, of the municipality. In this case, uh, the CAO has been delegated those, those powers. Uh, Division 5 of Part 17, Section 640 through 646, uh, deals specifically with the regulation of land use through land use bylaws. Section 683 of the MGA requires the issuance of development permits prior to any development unless otherwise provided for in a land use bylaw. And then Section 642, subsection 1 uh, states, and, and this is important here, uh, when a person applies for a development permit in respect of a development provided for by a land use bylaw per section, pursuant to Section uh, 640, the development authority must if the application otherwise conforms to the land use bylaw and is complete in accordance with section 683.1, issue a development permit with or without conditions as, as provided for in the land use bylaw. And so, and section 684 to 687 address uh, appeal of development permits. So we're not raising any objection or concern with, with respect to the validity of the land use bylaw. The appointment of the CAO as development authority or with the process followed by town of Drumheller staff. Our concerns focus specifically on the administration of development permits in accordance with section 642 sub 1 of the Municipal Government Act. And again the final clause of the subsection states issue a development permit with or without conditions as provided for in the land use bylaw. The essential point here is that if a development authority chooses to include conditions on a development permit these conditions must be provided for in the land use bylaw. So this authority is subject to limits. So I'm going to address um, land use bylaw 16.20. Uh, this bylaw was just passed recently in December of 2020. <clears throat> and uh, as, uh, as the development officer has already laid out for you, it includes a list of conditions that may be imposed when a development permit is issued. And these are set out in section 5.14. At 5.14.1, the development authority may impose such conditions on the approval of an application as, in their opinion, are necessary to one, uphold the intent and objectives of the municipal development plan, two, uphold the intent and objectives of any other statutory plan or non-statutory plan under preparation or as adopted that is applicable to the site, three, meet the applicable requirements of this bylaw, and four, ensure the orderly and economic development of land within the town. So section 5.14.2, uh, 5 as uh, Mr. Drovomirsky has already said, uh, deals with the imposition of um, offsite levies and, and development engineering standards. Not a, those are not applicable in this case because we're dealing with an existing dwelling uh, with no alterations, structural or otherwise anticipated. So while at first glance, the provisions of the, of the land use bylaw may seem to enable a broad range of development permit conditions, they I would, I'm going to argue that they are in fact quite specific. There needs to be a thread connecting the policies of any council adopted plan to the approval or the provisions must be specifically provided for in the land use bylaw. 
Now, I will say the Alberta land use bylaw approach is inherently different than zoning bylaws in other provinces, but in, in that it gives significant discretion to the development authority, but this discretion is not absolute. Fairness in decision-making means that decisions must be based on the guidance provided by council when plans and bylaws are, are approved. So with respect to the MDP, it would need to be shown that the development permit conditions are in fact related to one or more policies of the MDP. To be clear, there are numerous policies of the MDP that are clearly implemented through the proper administration of development permits. These include matters like ensuring that new buildings are consistent with neighborhood character, things like massing, placement, roof lines, siding material, and other things. Uh, are, these, are, these are things that could conceivably be regulated by the development authority uh, in accordance with the MDP. Also landscaping, screening, and other measures to address concerns about compatibility of adjacent land uses are well within the scope of this section of the LUB and the MDP. However, none of these are relevant in, in the context uh, it, with this application. The subject property is a two-story home that was built in the 1920s. It's located in a well-established residential neighborhood. No building alterations inside or out are needed to establish the tourist dwelling use. And in fact, the MDP encourages tourism and the creation of suitable accommodation for visitors. So getting down to the reasons for appeal, uh, condition two, uh, so my client's concerns with conditions imposed are as follows. Starting with condition two, must conform to the Town of Drumheller Community Standards Bylaw uh, 0619. Excuse me. So the Community Standards Bylaw has a range of provisions that address unsightly premises, weeds, noise, nuisance, and public behavior. We surmise that the development authority is most concerned about ensuring compliance with the requirements around the maintenance of the property and perhaps noise. However, the owner is obliged to follow, obliged to follow the community standards bylaw in any event, including this requirement as a condition of the development permit is redundant and not related to the land use bylaw. Now, the development officer has raised that the MDP uh, says that um, uh, and I'm going to read from the MDP briefly, prioritize the, the enforcement of the community standards bylaw in the downtown. Now, downtown here is lowercase, not defined. Um, uh, there's, there's no mapping in the MDP that defines the downtown that, uh, that I can find from my quick scan because I hadn't anticipated this issue. But uh, the, when I look at the, the land use bylaw, this property is located squarely in the neighbor in the neighborhood district, not in the downtown district. And so while the the downtown area redevelopment plan might be uh, there, there might be an intent to deal with this more broadly, it's not yet an approved statutory plan. And uh, and also the uh, uh, there, there again, there's no specific reference in, in the MDP making this part of the downtown. So I would, I would suggest that perhaps this, this condition is premature in that regard. Um, if, if the area redevelopment plan was in place, um, it was, was a, then, then there would be a basis for, for including the provision. So I'm going to jump to, or move to condition number three. Um, an annual business license is required. Indeed it is. Uh, the town's business license bylaw requires annual licensing, but this requirement is wholly unrelated to and separate from the control of land use. It's not a land use provision. Business licensing, I, I would submit as a restriction on the right to operate a business. And, and it's, it's got legitimacy. It, uh, it's legitimate purposes are found in, in revenue generation as an alternative to business taxes and as a means of consumer protection. Uh, an example of consumer protection would be uh, if someone wants, uh, being a pawnbroker is a legitimate business. However, uh, experience shows that uh, uh, thieves might want to, to uh, sell goods to pawnbrokers and therefore a business license process for a pawnbroker would often include consultation with the police before issuing the license to, to ensure that it's a person of suitable character to be running a pawn, a pawn shop. So that's consumer protection. Uh, and there are countless other examples I think that you could come up with. And incident, incidentally, a business license has been acquired from the town. So that is in place already. Uh, condition, we, we just want to see it removed from the development permit. Uh, condition 10, or sorry, yeah, condition 10. 
The site and buildings, structures and improvements shall be maintained in a clean, neat, tidy and attractive condition and free from all rubbish and debris. Again, this provision is, is unrelated to the regulation of land use. It, it effectively repeats condition two. Now the development officer has indicated that there's, there's going to be a, a housekeeping amendment to the land use bylaw to, to clean up some deficiencies that have been identified. Uh, and this provision was in the old bylaw and will be placed in the new. Uh, council certainly has the ability to approve that, that amendment, but that, uh, that language does not exist uh, in the bylaw today. And, uh, and, and it didn't exist when the, when the development permit was applied for. So I would suggest that it's, it's, uh, it's inappropriate to have it as a condition of, uh, of, of the development permit. And condition 11. Uh, development shall conform to any or all federal, provincial, and or municipal regulations and or guidelines that may apply. Again, this provision is unrelated to the regulation of land use and is not authorized by the land use bylaw. It's, it's a catch-all, but it doesn't need to be there. Um, condition 12. Prior to the commencement of occupancy and business activities, confir confirmation must be provided to the development officer from the local fire authority and health authority that the building is occupiable for such purposes. Um, I will say that as part of the application process, I provided um, floor plans uh, to the to the development to the development officer. Um, those floor plans show uh, that each of the bedrooms has actually two windows, so uh, normal egress requirements are met, and they're they're all single hung windows of a of a suitable size uh, for emergency egress if that's required. There is a separate basement uh, bedroom, um, but the basement actually has its own exterior uh, um, door as well, with a, leading to a, a set of exterior stairs. And so, uh, by by no, normal standards, I, I don't think there, the, the the house certainly meets current uh, fire safety requirements in, in that structurally in that regard. Um, well, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that for sure, but in, in general, it appears to, to meet uh, standards for egress that you would expect of a new, of a new home. Uh, and again, this provision is not authorized by the land use bylaw, nor is it related to the compatibility of the land use uh, within the context of a residential neighborhood. It may, be appropriate it may be an appropriate provision of a business licensing bylaw to ensure the safety of guests of the tourist world. Uh, even then, a tourist dwelling is not a hotel, but rather the short-term rental as opposed to monthly of a private home that is not normally subject to inspection. So condition 13, the development shall be revocable at any time if the use is or has become detrimental to the amenities of the neighborhood. This condition is also not authorized by the land use bylaw. This condition seems to grant arbitrary powers that could result in a situation where the owner of a permitted use that has been properly approved is suddenly denied the, denied the right to continue to operate the use that is clearly permitted by the land use bylaw. Development permits can be revoked or suspended if a development does not proceed within a specified time frame as provided, as provided by the land use bylaw. Typically, if you don't start within a year and have the development done within two years, you would at least have to ask for an extension to the permit. But uh, if a development is completed in accordance with the, per with the permit, revocation would be arbitrary and unfair. Now, I will say that the challenges of bylaw enforcement in the case of neighborhood concerns are not lost on the applicant. And in my own case, I have I've supervised bylaw enforcement. I've dealt with um, uh, these these kinds of issues where the neighborhoods are, where neighbors are concerned and, and it's not easy to to enforce bylaws it's it's there's process involved however we, we need to use the right tools and there are numerous tools to deal with these kinds of concerns uh, the community standards bylaw uh, obviously and also orders pursuant to section 545 of the, of the municipal government act uh, they're they're strong tools but the and the uh, if it People are reluctant to use them, but they're they're absolutely there if if, if required. And uh, finally, uh, I'm going to come to condition E. Condition E purports to invalidate the development permit upon appeal. Now, if this was a permit for a discretionary use, subject to appeal by another affected party, for example, if it's a discretionary use, um, neighbors have the right to appeal the the decision of the development authority. 
So it would make sense to suspend the, the permit that's been issued until the hearing process has run its course. However, the, this current wording is applied to a permit for a permitted use. Um, why can't the permitted use continue while the conditions are being talked about, as long as the, 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 per, the requirements of the permit are generally being, are, are being followed? Uh, if the current wording applied to a permit for permitted use appears to penalize the applicant for having the temerity to question the conditions by submitting a notice of appeal. Uh, a small point maybe, but uh, I think it's, a, it's an important one in terms of process, uh, following, having a clear process and following it. Um, so the essential conclusion is that these conditions are not land use or development related. They're not authorized by the land use bylaw and represent an overreach on the part of the development authority. And uh, the remedy that we're asking for is really quite simple. The reissuance of development permit T, how many zeros is that? Is it four zeros or three? Zero, 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 eight, three, uh, dash two, one D with the conditions discussed removed from the permit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for bearing with me. You are muted, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Flutman. I was just trying to get my mouse to the right place. Um, I'm just making a couple of notes here. Bear with me, please. Okay. Um, as there are no other uh, people wishing to speak in this matter, we will move on to questions then from the board. Are there any questions uh, directed at Mr. Flutman? Christine, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Um, Albert, just to pop back to number 10 there, I just want to wrap my head around why that point you believe should not be included. Is that you believe it is invalid because of the land use bylaw tourist dwelling neighborhood district, correct? Not, not the community standards bylaw is what you guys were referring to there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just asking if, if Councillor DeMott is referring to uh, site and buildings, structures and improvements shall be maintained, et cetera? Yes, that's the one there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? Um, well, because you have said now you that you believe the condition tenant is invalid, and I'm just wondering on, on the grounds of the land use bylaw, tourist dwelling in the neighbourhood district, is that what you were focusing on to make it invalid, or was this the community standards? Mm. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, this this provision looks a lot like the uh, provision requiring the the owner to abide by the community standards bylaw. There is certainly crossover here. Uh, this language, um, it's it actually it's in this case I would say huh, it it gets a little bit confusing because the the MDP does talk about community standards, but uh, if we focus on on this condition by itself. The previous land use bylaw included this kind of language. And so I can, I can understand how the development authority has carried over from, from they, they used the, the format and the standard conditions used previously and, 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 and rolled them over and have included them in, in, in the new development permit. But the current bylaw does not authorize this condition to be included. The language isn't there. Like, unfortunately, yeah, we haven't actually uh, displayed the, the development permit as issued. There's conditions like um, uh, an owner or manager must be present within the town of Drumheller while the, unit, while the home is rented out. And that's actually language right out of the land use bylaw. It's authorized by the land, the land use bylaw. Therefore, that's why we're not appealing it. Um, we, it's, it's there. It's, it's got legitimacy because it's in the land use bylaw. I'm saying this condition shouldn't be attached to the development permit because it's not in the land use bylaw as currently written. Notwithstanding the fact that next month council is going to see an amendment to the land use bylaw that would put it back in. Um, it's, in, in this case, I, I would argue that it's, it's not appropriate. Okay, thank you. thank you. Yeah, I, I was just looking for that clarification there. And um, yeah, I guess that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, well, next we'll move to Eileen. Yes, um, I'd just like to clarify on the statement I made previously about not attending the property. Um, that is That condition is since this appeal was filed. I have attended that property many, many times in the past, but that was prior to this owner owning it. 
So I just wanted to make that clear. Mr. Chairman, may I have a comment? Yeah, absolutely, please. Yeah, Drumheller is a small town. I'm sure you're a longstanding resident. You, I'm sure you're familiar with the property. As, but as long as we follow the process, uh, and yeah. I have no concerns about that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Eileen and Albert. And uh, Mr. Duromirsky. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I just wanted to correct and uh, maybe thank, um, uh, just correct Albert, we were not going to actually add point 10 into the land use bylaw revision. It was actually a point, it was uh, the point further, point 13 uh, was, but if you, so yeah, that we were not going to add that in because we actually do feel it's redundant to the community standards bylaw uh, that's noted in point two, so. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. But, but, but we could if you'd like to. So, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think that's quite all right. My apologies for, for misunderstanding. Um, are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Flutman? Uh, Sharon, yes. go ahead, please. <clears throat> yes, and perhaps I'm just being a little bit confused here, but uh, the community standards bylaw is municipal legislation. Is that not correct? I would agree with that, Mr. Chairman. And in that case, when I look at the land use bylaws, section 1.3.4, and, and uh, Mr. Demersky referred to this earlier, uh, a person is required to comply with all federal, provincial, and other municipal legislation. So I'm a little confused about why, and perhaps I'm just missing something, but why there seems to be some issue with this development complying with community, community standards bylaw since it's a, it's a requirement that uh, municipal legislation be complied with. Uh, the, the, Mr. Chairman, the point that the appellant is seeking to make is that um, the, he has to abide by the community standards bylaw in any event, it's, re, it's redundant to put it in, uh, include it as a condition of the development permit. But of course, uh, the, the member is pointing out that uh, this language is in the, in the text of, of, of the land use bylaw. So I, and on, on this point, I stand corrected. So thank you. Thank you. And I, another question, sir, if I could as well, could you just um, again summarize Sorry, I'm looking for my notes here. Oh, could you just summarize please for me again, the concerns that you have regarding the development authority condition that this proposed development obtain an annual business license. I know you said that the, the license has been sought and obtained, but again, why, why is there concern about obtaining an, an annual business license? Mr. Chairman, there's actually no concern about uh, obtaining an annual business license in, in, in this case. Uh, the concern is that we've got conditions attached to a development permit that are not related to land use. Uh, we, we would argue that a business license is not a land use provision and it's not development related. It, it's, it's related to the business activity and, and, and nothing else. Anything else, Sharon? No, thank you very much. Not at this point, thank you. Thank you. Um, Christine has a question, I see. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to catch up here. Go ahead, Christine. Thanks, sorry. So I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this other part of it too. So it's, it's not that the, appellate wants, doesn't want to conform with the community standards bylaw. They just feel it's it's redundant in this permit? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a question of process and, and, legit, and uh, le legitimately imposing conditions on, on a development. Um, if, if any conditions that are actually related to land use, we would fully accept the, that they're, they're appropriate. Uh, if, if they're authorized by the land use bylaw and, and, and they're land use related conditions, absolutely. But um, conforming to the, 
well, of course, the, the owner has every intention of, of, of complying with the community standards bylaw. That isn't the question, uh, or that isn't the concern or the issue. The concern is tying the approval of a development to complying with a bylaw that he must comply with anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions at this point? I don't believe there's any others uh, that wish to speak to the appeal. So Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, we will label this presentation SDAB 2021-07.13 number two. Thank you. And that will include the letter that Mr. Flutman commented on. Okay. Uh, what? Were there any other comments or correspondence that was received, Denise? No, there were no other written submissions or comments received. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move into section 10, which are the board member questions. Uh, we'll start out with questions to the development authority specifically. Are there any questions from the SDAB board? Maybe I'll start out with one. Um, I'd like some clarification, please, on whether or not there's a direct relationship between a development permit, a business license, and other town of Drumheller bylaws. So we know that bylaws in all cases have to be followed and uh, um, complied with, but um, there seems to be some clarification required as to how each bylaw operates independently versus together. So if I, I think I'm addressing your question, Mr. Chairman. So I think one of the reasons that the uh, conditions, uh, or I'll, I'll use air quotes of conditions uh, in the notice of decisions are, are listed is because in many cases, uh, the applicants are not as well versed in bylaws as this applicant was, or um, as Mr. Flutman is. And as a result, you really are having to uh, spell out what would be considered simple items for the applicant to follow. So many people who uh, open businesses have no, have, have no idea that they actually require a business license. So apply for a development permit without understanding that they have to get a business license or vice versa. Uh, so they, unfortunately, uh, this, and, and again, as our suggestion is that we, perhaps our donors of decision going forward are labeled as conditions. So in agreement with Mr. Flutman's uh, comments about conditions related to land use, and then general requirements for doing your, whatever it is your use is in your community. So if it's a commercial business, a business license, um, if it's an apartment or something, you have a health inspection. So just so, what we were, what we have tried to do is try to make it simple so that the, there's kind of a menu or a, a table of contents about what's the expectation for applicants uh, for it. So I think that is how some of these has been, have been tied together and, and uh, also correct and admitted in our presentation that they're our old land use bylaw, which was much more um, large and specific, uh, had some of these clauses included in it uh, that were probably not in the land use, shouldn't have been in the land use bylaw when they were adopted in the first place. Uh, because again, land use does deal, bylaw, the land use bylaw does deal with land use. So I think that, I, I mean, I think we've already talked about internally about changing the notice of decision to include a requirement section and taking those things out. So just so that people understand what they're doing, because again, a good number of our applicants do not know what some of the things that um, Mr. Flutman's raised through his application uh, here, so. Thank you. Uh, my next question is kind of a follow on question. Um, we know that it is very specific in the land use bylaw as to what conditions can be noted. Uh, is there anything that defines the format and content of the notice of decision 
that would prevent a requirement section from being included? I, I don't believe so. Uh, I think that, again, it would be more of a, uh, here are the conditions and then FYI, here's other things that you should do. And whether that comes as a notice of decision, essentially to save paper, or as it comes as a separate attachment to uh, just general rules around around knowing that you, here's the things you need to follow in the community. Uh, and I think some of that's born out of just, there are different standards in different centers. Uh, so that we believe that it can uh, exist on one document uh, and we're not tying a condition of an annual, it's going forward of an annual business license to whether or not uh, the development would be revoked. So further to that, um, a business license defines the appellant's ability to operate it as a tourist residence. Um, if a business license was revoked, it wouldn't necessarily change the fact that the development permit had been approved and therefore they couldn't operate the business, but the development permit would continue on infinitum, would it not? So I think maybe if, uh, if this is your question, so if next year the applicant decided to not get a business license, would we be able to revoke the development permit because they did not follow that condition in the viol in, in the notice of decision? I believe, is that your question or paraphrasing it? It, it could be. It could also yeah. be a condition that, uh, or a situation where we revoke the license um, in a subsequent sure. term. Sure, right. Um, and so that would, in my opinion, would uh, in and of itself would not be uh, a revocation of the development permit. I believe that that would be um, something that would need to be reviewed as part of the greater, there may be other reasons why. So I think in and of itself, any one of those clauses would not uh, constitute a revocation of the entire permit. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Joe Amersky, uh, Christine? Yeah, and you actually totally asked the question I was going to ask. So regarding bringing in a requirements section is, so that isn't anything that's going to require any bylaw changes or anything like that, Daryl. And are we able to bring that in now and have it apply to this particular case? So to answer in reverse, it wouldn't apply to this particular case because this particular case has um, is already an appeal. So it would be on a go forward basis if we make this change. Uh, I would need to confirm 100%, but I don't believe that there's a reason why you could not provide some form of general requirements. Uh, and and it, again, it's more of a good neighbor guide for, and, and, and let's take away tourist dwelling and let's, it's a business in the industrial park in the employment district or it's a house in a, a neighborhood central area or, or something to that effect. I think it's just a good feature to have regardless. And so it does not uh, weigh into conditions. We would not tie it to, a con to the, one of the conditions is you must follow all requirements. Uh, uh, it would simply be here are the requirements to have your, your application for, or your successful application for the being a town of Drumheller. Right. And so then kind of looking at point E, then those requirements, they could still be permitted and continue on if requirements weren't met, but conditions must be met. Is that what you meant? So point, point E is completely different. What the, the intent of point E is that um, the permit cannot continue uh, while it is being appealed. Uh, and so, you know, an example of that, not so again, I'm not going to use a different example than this. So someone was uh, starting to construct a home, was it was given a, a, a development permit to construct a home, but sometime in the 21 day period, so they started construction. However, it was a discretionary use and it's being appealed. And so anything that, and if the appeal is successful, then the applicant must 
remove whatever parts of the house that were in um, uh, in um, that were a concern. In a permitted use, it would be so. What we're saying is that in a permitted use, if the applicant is appealing the conditions, it's very tough to be able to say, well, you can go ahead because it's permitted. Uh, and appeal the conditions that you feel are preventing you from actually operating your business in this case, or operating your your tourist dwelling. So I, I just I the opinion we have is that it's it's very hard to be able to say yes, you can continue. Um, however, uh, we're bringing it before SDAB to see whether or not you can continue or not. So that was really good information. My apologies, I had misinterpreted. No, okay. No. Glad to answer it. Um, Eileen, I believe you had your hand up. Yes, but uh, he just answered my question. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one more question, if I could, please. Uh, in section 5.14.1, uh, subsection 2 of the land use bylaw, it refers to uh, statutory plan or non-statutory plan. Uh, I apologize, I don't know those definitions. Could you identify what they are and whether bylaws might in fact be a statutory plan. So an example of a statutory plan would be the municipal development plan. Uh, and I, I should defer this to the uh, um, appellant on this because you would know this far better than I do, but um, the, anything that is statutory that is usually passed by a bylaw or at a higher level from the province. So statutory is generally municipal development plan, land use plan, uh, in the case of the downtown area revitalization plan, uh, which was passed on Monday, um, as information, uh, that would be a statutory plan. Uh, so non-statutory plan or an area structure plan would be a statutory plan. Thank you for your nod. Um, and and then non-statutory plans, uh, examples of those, um, actually, I can't think of one right now. Uh, so bylaw is covered under, I believe it was 1.3.4, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, where it's talked about any legis any federal, provincial, or municipal legislation, that's where bylaws would be covered. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, Albert, I, I can comment yeah. on it with respect to non-statutory plans. Some municipalities use uh, neighborhood plans or outline plans, um, uh, which, which are uh, which sort of fit in the hierarchy under an area structure plan when, when someone's applying for a subdivision. And so that those plans don't have statutory authority uh, the way an area structure plan or a municipal development plan do. However, if they're council approved, they become a statement of council policy. Therefore, we are to have regard to them. And, and so that would be a non-statutory plan that, that would have to be considered by the development authority. Right. And then a statutory would be anything that was passed by a bylaw, I would suggest. So any land related by uh, statute, any land related plan passed by bylaw. Okay, but it would have to be land related. So the community um, standards plan uh, bylaw would not necessarily be land use related. So therefore would not apply in this case. Um, it would not apply under statutory or non-statutory. Um, just looking at the clause that I had said, um, I believe it's one, yeah, 1.3.5 or four, um, 1.3.4 or is in addition to the requirements of this bylaw, a person is required to comply with all federal, provincial, or other municipal legislation of which a land use, or sorry, of which uh, community standards or um, the tourism corridor bylaw would be applicable, a business license bylaw, uh, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Daryl at this point? Hearing none, uh, are there any other questions for the appellant, Mr. Flipman? Seeing none. Um, at this point, we'll go into final comments. Uh, um, Mr. Drohomirsky, you can provide final comments and then we'll have the appellant provide final comments, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, again, in conclusion, um, we believe that uh, a suitable, uh, 
solution going forward for this is to actually change the notice of decision document to have a requirement section. So again, not bound by a condition, but uh, these would be requirements, general requirements, and they would apply across all of the um, uh, no zoning districts. Uh, however, we do believe that some of these are applicable as conditions or, or should be stated. Uh, recognize the comments that uh, Mr. Flutman has made uh, and um, and we do yeah agree with a few of them, with some of them that they could be moved to an area outside of the conditions of a land use uh, and, and yeah I think just going forward we would aim to make that change so that it's clearer for people to understand what's required and, and uh, what's a condition. Okay, thank you, Mr. Flutman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just to summarize. Um, <clears throat> This appeal is not related to, um, is, is, there's no critique of the land use bylaw here. There's, there's no questioning of the authority to require an issue of development permit. Uh, again, it's simply, uh, we see a number of conditions that are not land use related. They're, they're related to community standards, they're related to business licensing, but not, not land use and development per se. And, and our request is that these conditions simply be removed from, from the development permit and, and the development uh, permit uh, reissued. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask that everyone feels that the board has all the material that we need to make a decision. And uh, seeing that no one is flagging otherwise, uh, this hearing is now concluded. The decision will be provided in writing within 15. Oh, Daryl, go ahead. I, does Eileen have something to say? She unmuted herself. No, nope, you're muted, muted again. Herself. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the decision will be provided in writing within 15 days of the conclusion of the hearing. Thank you very much, everyone. Denise, you can end the live stream now, please. You're muted.